If you have your Bibles, I want to go to Isaiah chapter 9. If you've been around our church for a while, you may have heard this passage before. If you've been here when we light the Advent candles, this is often a passage we read during that time. But if you have your Bibles or your phones, Isaiah chapter 9, it reads a little thick early on, but then it comes into a part that I think you'll find very familiar. In chapter 2 of verse 9 of Isaiah, it says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in a land of deep darkness, on them has the light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divided the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior and in battle tumult, uh, tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. I said last week we were forward-focused, hope-filled people. Does that ring a bell? So imagine standing with the people as Isaiah opened the scroll, opened his parchments, and read this to the people who, for generations, had been waiting for the coming Messiah. The Jewish people had been oppressed, had been slaves, had been in captivity, in and out of their land, and the prophecy was one would come that would set them free, that would flip the government upside down, that he would rule the Jewish people with sword and scepter in each hand. They would be God's people once again. If you are oppressed and the word is coming for freedom, that's good news, is it not? Not your question. If you've been oppressed and there's freedom coming, is that good news, church? When Isaiah shows up and says, for unto us a child is born, that's good news, isn't it? You long for that to be true, but how long do you wait until you stop longing? Because unless you lived to be 700 years old, you never saw that to come true. What do you do when you are a forward-focusing, hope-filled people and you don't get to see the thing that you were told you would get to see? What do you do when you long for something to be true, but live every day with it not coming true? What do you do if you're called to be hope-filled and forward-focusing, and you never get to realize and actualize the thing you hope for? I'll ask it this way. How long can you stay hoping without landing at the end goal? Let me ask it this way. What do you do when God says he'll do something and then doesn't do it? Does that sound fair? Have you felt that before? This room is way quiet. Have you ever wanted God to do something and he didn't do it? That's what I need you to do today. So the question becomes, not if you will respond, but how will you respond when you long for something to happen and it doesn't happen? I don't know about you, my MO is to start getting critical and cynical. Start to get negative. Start to complain and gripe. Because I know my theology I, I know the verses that say, pray, and if you have the faith of a mustard seed, that God will move mountains, and I can quote the verses, and I know the theology, and so I'll pray for something. I mean, the faith of a mustard seed. Wouldn't it be more compelling and soothing if it said, uh, the faith is the size of Mount Everest? Wouldn't that make you feel better? Because then you could say, well, 
I don't think I have Mount Everest size faith. But when he says the faith of a mustard seed, like the head of a pin, like surely I've got that much. And I prayed for something good to happen. I know who God is. I know he's powerful. My prayer seems fair. So why wouldn't God do it? And then he kind of tells you, not yet. And the longer you wait, the more cynical you get, the more critical you get, or at least I do. You start to get apathetic. Have you noticed that when God doesn't move, you just start to shrug your shoulders, start to think like, yeah, I don't think God moves anymore. A new one I've tried, this is a new one. You can try this on if you want to be as uh, spiritually mature as I am. Try this one. This one's been working for me for the last while. When God doesn't do the miraculous thing that he said he was going to do in a time that fits my convenience, I just do something else that's more convenient and attainable to keep myself satisfied. Does that track? God, if you don't do the miraculous, I'll just do something. Because I'd rather do something than wait on you doing the impossible. Maybe you're more mature than I am. But the longer I'm hope-filled without realization, the worse off I get. Now here's the kicker. That's actually biblical. You read in Proverbs, it says, hope deferred, hope kicked forward, makes the heart grow sick. So, the longer you go believing God will do something and he doesn't seem to do it, you are in ripe season to get a sick heart. Ever been there before? Now, the crazy part is Merry Christmas. (laughs) Isn't this a cheery one? The crazy part is this is actually good news. While this feels like the most depressing sermon you've ever listened to on Christmas, if you can get where I'm taking us to go, you are in the spot to receive a blessing. There is a gift in longing for something and it not happening, in the gap, there is a gift there. The crazy part is, as God's people over the last number of generations, we have tried to convince you not to take the gift. When God's not moving in your life, when you're not seeing his hand at work, you are to do something. And us spiritually immature people came along and we did everything in our power to convince you not to do the thing that God invites you to do. We came along and we started to say things like, everything happens for a reason. You've heard that before, right? You were going through a difficult season and some well-meaning Christian said, don't worry, everything happens for a reason. And you punch them in the nose. You were standing at a funeral of a loved one and someone came through the line and they hugged you and said in your ear, better days are coming. And you kicked them in the shin. You've been there, right? You've been in the gap where you long for something better. It wasn't happening. And a well-meaning Christian, when God wanted to offer you a gift, tried to release the tension by saying something that's true but mistimed. What happens is, we don't like God's gift, so we try to convince you not to go there. In the gap of longing for something to happen and it not happening, in the praying for something to happen, in the prayer not being answered, God offers you a gift. The gift is a lament. Do you know what lament is? Most people don't. I've been having a number of conversations this week about lament, and they don't know what it is. And to prove I'm not condescending, I know what it is, and then openly don't do it. How's that? That's worse than being ignorant. 
The gift in the middle when God's not doing something is the gift of lament where you sit and you weep and you wail and you cry out at the injustice, the mourning, and the unmet expectations before God. Now here's the thing. I don't want you to lament because it makes me uncomfortable. Have you noticed that in our society? We want to do the funerals as fast as possible. We want you and I want you to grieve with a smile on your face because that puts me at ease. We want each other to say things like grin and bear it, better days ahead, God's got a plan. Like we want these things because the alternative makes us really uncomfortable. But through generations and generations in Scripture, there was this practice called lament that God's people did in the gap period. You go through the Scriptures and you will find page after page when you hit sorrow or injustice or battles that are lost or sin that people are confronted with, the reaction of an injustice or a season of mourning is to sit down and lament and feel the pain. And here's the crazy part. If you are someone like me who is uh, emotionally stunted and more spiritually immature than I would care to admit, you hired professional mourners. So if you didn't know how to mourn and grieve, you'd hire a professional person over to lead you in proper grieving and mourning. Now the room is weirdly quiet, which I expected today. You're all reacting to this differently. Some of you, this is almost like a cool drink of water to hear permission that you can lament and weep and wail at the injustice. A bunch of you are uncomfortable with this. You're called men. <laughs> Most of the men that I know in Southwest Nova keep a stiff upper lip. <laughs> and hold it together, and are tough. And the thought of some weenie pastor up here talking about sitting around and feeling your feelings is like, this is why I don't go to church. Hang tight. There is a gift here. There is a blessing in lament when we sit down and we cry out before God, this is not right. God, I am hurting. God, this should not have happened this way. When we sit there, there is a gift. Part of the blessing of why God invites us to lament is the blessing of practicing honesty. Now, I'm going to make a broad statement, and I feel like after an entire lifetime of being in the church, I'm, I have the credit to say it. Most Christians that I have ever, meet, ever met ever interacted with, ever done ministry with, ever done small groups with, have an incredible difficult time being honest because they value being nice to an unhealthy degree. I have sat in rooms and listened to nice prayers that were not honest. I have sat in small group discussions where we ask questions about why an all-powerful God didn't heal something when he could have, and I heard all the polite, theologically correct answers, but I did not hear honesty. I have sat with couples where they needed to have an intervention in counseling. I have sat between non-married people who needed an intervention in counseling, and they could not find it because they valued being nice and polite over being honest, and healing remained unavailable. And so what happens is we come before God with our Canadian decency and our politeness values, and we say things to God that are just flat-out untrue. We pray to God like we're speaking to him in the foyer of the church. I asked a bunch of you, how are you doing on purpose? And your words were almost always good. And one person said, good, what else am I going to say? 
And that's what I would say. But your, lo- your eyes betrayed you. You've heard someone say they're doing good and their eyes betrayed them, right? Like you know they're not doing good. And so we come to prayer like he's in the foyer and we do this polite, nonsensical prayer back and forth. It passes the theological checkboxes, but it's not a shred of honesty in it. And the hard part is we feel like somewhere he's God, he's holy. I should kind of mind my manners and be careful because he's God. But I'm begging you, if you think that, I'm not sure you've read your entire Bible. The only people who feel they need to be nice to God are people who have not wrestled with the text. Now, if you doubt me, you can go to Psalm 109 this afternoon, and you can read our dear King David sit down and pen this words about his enemy. Do you have an enemy in your life? What did I just say about being honest? (laughs) David sits down with his enemy in mind and hear the words he says, Psalm 109. God, make his children fatherless. Make his wife a widow. What were you saying about not being able to pray honestly? Now, if I was going to teach theology about prayer, I'm not using Psalm 109. That's not the point of Psalm 109. Psalm 109 is an invitation. We get to peer into somebody just cracking the chest open and letting it rip. I'm glad God doesn't answer all of our prayers, but I'm glad God's big enough to listen to all of our prayers. And some of you are missing lament as I have missed lament because I'm too theologically accurate to get honest. Some of you need to say outlandish things before God. Some of you need to lose it before God with incredible honesty about how you're actually feeling. Now, here's the kicker, if I can sweeten it for you. He already knows. What did you think you were doing? Did you think you were sitting before God Almighty and were tricking him? We may fool each other in the foyer in the Walmart, but you're going to sit down believing that God is listening to you and then selling him a bag of garbage? That's the placing I'll say online in this sanctuary. So here's the deal. When you pray with dishonesty, you are masquerading and performing. If you don't like those words, how's this word? You're lying. You are lying before the one person who knows how you're actually doing. The gift of lament is that you get to be honest before God the Father. The second blessing of lament is that it invites us to have access to the presence of God in ways we won't otherwise. That was a really clunky sentence. I'm sorry. (laughs) In Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, Jesus says in the Beatitudes, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I don't know if you were in church in the era when it was preached that the Beatitudes were the pathway to blessing. Like, here are the people who are blessed, so go practice these things. Like, conjure it up and Jesus will bless you. That's, That's not really what it is. These aren't like the nine keys to success. Jesus was saying... Blessed are those who mourn, like if you're mourning, oh, you're about to be blessed. Do you hear it that way? If you're mourning, if you're lamenting, you're about to be blessed. Because people who mourn and lament are in a position to receive God's blessing and presence in a way they can't if they won't mourn and be honest. See, as long as you're unwilling to mourn and lament and be honest, you are closing yourself off to a greater dependence and a need on God. As long as you want to pull yourself up from your bootstraps, as long as you want to grin and bear it, as long as you want to live by the power of positive thinking, you are missing out on God's blessing to your inner being. 
I say this to you not hypothetical, but from experience. I have watched myself close myself off from God's ministry to the deepest parts of my inward being because I was too busy being a good pastor. I don't know all your stories, but I was born right into the church. And you didn't lament because lament looked like weakness. You didn't weep and wail because don't you have faith that God will do something? You couldn't be honest. You had to smile and keep the stiff upper lip act going because people need to lean on you. I'm a third generation pastor's kid. Every room I've ever been in has been under the banner, be a good example for those around you. Of my entire life, I've never known a day on this earth where I wasn't performing for the room I was in. It wasn't that I was dishonest. It's just that I walled up so that you couldn't hurt me. If you can't hurt me, then I can keep leading you. Does that make sense? If I don't feel pain and grief, then I can keep doing the pastor thing. If I've got to preach, I better be careful. I'm going to start lamenting in front of you. If we're not careful, we will rob each other the blessing of being broken in front of each other. And I was taught that you can be broken, but I can't. I'm telling you, if we don't practice lament, we will miss God's presence to our innermost being. Now, here's the kicker, because I do have good news for you. When you get honest before God and you let God minister to your inner being, it's actually, lament is actually the pathway to joy and celebration. Here's what was revealed to me this week by God's gentle grace. As somebody who has prided himself on not feeling pain in ministry, not feeling whatever you are feeling so that I can stay in a position to minister to you, I started to practice numbing out. I've done funerals. I've heard your confessions. I've lived in this community long enough that my attitude was the more I can numb out, the better I can minister to you. So what happened is the more I numbed out to pain, there's a correlating effect that you numb out to joy. Wouldn't it be fantastic if you were created compartmentalized? Wouldn't it be great if you could live your life actually in sections and chunks? Because I don't know about you, I would love to turn off the pain valve and turn the joy valve wide open. Am I alone? You want to have fun, right? You want to feel less pain, right? Then put me in charge. <laughs> I will lead us to numb out in pain. If only. If you numb out to pain, you are numbing out to joy. I have gotten so good at not lamenting and not feeling pain that I have baptized people that I celebrate with you but I feel nothing inside. I stood in the Mariner Center with 2,200 people thinking, I can do better. Next year we'll do two services. That's how maniacal it gets. If you stop being human and stop feeling pain, you will stop feeling joy then you'll be left to decide how far can I turn the joy dial up so I can feel something. Are we still tracking? You and I are fully human. We don't get the choice to only have good times. To feel the pain is giving God permission to let you feel the joy. He restores you from your innermost being. So, spiritual formation time. This is, this is just 
information at this point. I'm, I'm pleading with you to join me in practicing some lament this week. The, the first thing we need to do, and I'm going first, so come with me or don't, I'll go alone. We need to take the pain to God. We, I was going to say you, we, we need to take it to God and get brutally honest. I have got so much pent up anger from the last three years, I can't even see straight. I've got stuff from three years ago that you probably forgot even happened. And I've got so much anger stored up there somewhere that I need to deal with. If you don't deal with it, guess what will happen? You will walk around with gaping wounds all over yourself. And you will bleed in every room you're in. Did you know that? You do, because you've watched me do it for three years. You have watched me preach to you, and all of a sudden, when I get irritated or agitated, I will say something, and you all thought, I don't think you should say that. You can be honest, it's okay. <laughs> I've been in meetings, and a blood was dripping down my elbow that I wasn't dealing with, and someone said something, and I reacted, and the people in the room probably thought, I don't think you should do that. Because if you don't take it to God, he can't provide the healing that you need. Some of you are bleeding and dripping from things that happened to you 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. And someone told you to put your chin up. Put a smile on your... Like someone told you garbage and you believed it like I believed it. And so every room you walk in, it's just bleeding all over the place. Second thing, after taking it to God, you need to take it to godly community. Please, hear me loud and clear. Godly community is not Facebook. <laughs> Please, I beg of you, do not bleed on Facebook. Do not lament on Facebook. Please don't do it. That is a poor substitution for real incarnational people, flesh and blood in front of you. Now, for some of you are thinking, nope, nope, I'm begging you to hear me out. You will be hurting, bleeding, or wounded so bad that your faith will be in jeopardy. You won't be able to see the gospel clearly or preach the gospel to yourself and you will need somebody across the table to remind you in the right way at the right time of who God is. Don't confuse that for funeral processionals, Facebook comments, or even public group settings. I am talking intimate groups of two, three, or four tightly wound people. People that when your faith is so low and you can't pray anymore, they step in and pray for you and intercede in a way for you that you would swear they're praying your very thoughts. When Paul says bear one another's burdens, this is what he means. This will be very few people where you are uncensored, brutally honest, and you can pray that your enemies are being taken out and that the kids will have no father and the wife will have no husband kind of honesty. You'll be blessed to have two or three of these people in your life ever. Third thing for spiritual formation. Take it to a conclusion. One of the things you notice in Scripture is that they lament, they grieve, they weep, they wail, they mourn, they feel the brutal injustices. They feel the unmet expectations, the unanswered prayers, the things that were lost in this world, the times that God sh didn't show up when he said he would or he should have, or in the time that we thought he should. And we sit there and we feel it. But then when you notice in Scripture, eventually they stand up, they shower, they wash themselves, and they go on moving forward in what they know to be true. And what they know to be true is that God is good. See, part of what happens 
is we don't bring it to a conclusion where we step over and say, I have grieved, I have mourned, and I have lamented. I did the hard work with God. Now it's a new day. God remains good, and I'm going to continue to be a person who longs forward and hopes for what is yet to come. Church, if you're like me, you are in jeopardy of losing the ability to long, not because it's a hope issue. If you're like me, you're going to risk losing the ability to long and hope because you don't know how to lament. Part of lamenting is being healthy enough to long for a better day. That's who our God is, church. We are forward-focusing, hope-filled people, but we must not skip grieving what's not kingdom today. 